the AI race is heating up and we're seeing companies and founders go all in. They're reporting they'd rather go bankrupt than lose this race. Over the past three years, we have already built out in data center capacity a larger amount of dollars than the entire US interstate highway system, which took 40 years, just in terms of dollars, and that's inflation adjusted. OpenAI alone, I think, has more than a trillion dollars of deals set up that they've committed to, and we can talk about that. Um, but at the same time, so those are all like big numbers on infrastructure, and they're scary, and they say, oh, bubble. And Google uh, released a stat recently that they have seen a 150x increase in the amount of tokens processed in the last 17 months. So on the one hand, you've got this crazy, scary sounding build out. On the other hand, you actually have a bunch of usage that's happening. So are we in an AI bubble? Uh, I do not believe we're in an AI bubble today. Uh, I was, um, I had, depending on how you look at it, the privilege and the misfortune of being a tech investor during the, um, the year 2000 bubble, which was really a telecom bubble. And I think it's really helpful to compare and contrast today to the year 2000. Um, you know, first, I think uh, Cisco peaked at 150 or 180 times trailing earnings, NVIDIA's at more like 40 times. So valuations are very differently, very different. Most important, however, is that the year 2000 internet bubble or telecom bubble was defined by something called dark fiber. Um, and if you're a veteran of, of the year 2000, you'll know what that was. But dark fiber was literally fiber that was laid down in the ground and not lit up. Fiber is useless unless you have the optics and switches and routers uh, that you need on either side. Um, you know, so I vividly remember you know, companies like Level 3 or Global Crossing or WorldCom would come in and they say, we laid 200,000 miles of dark fiber this quarter. This is so amazing. The internet's going to be so big. Um, you know, we can't wait to light these up. At the peak of the bubble, 97% of the fiber that had been laid in America was dark. Contrast that with today. There are no dark GPUs. All you have to do is read any technical paper. And that one of the biggest problems in a trading run is that GPUs are melting. And there's a very simple way to kind of cut to the heart of all of this. It is the return on invested capital of the biggest spenders on GPUs, who are all public. And those companies, since they ramped up CapEx, have seen, call it a 10-point increase in their ROICs. So thus far, the ROI on all the spending has been really positive. It's a really, it's an interesting and open debate about whether or not it will continue to be positive with the quantum of spend we're going to have on Blackwell. I personally think it will. But there's no debate that thus far the ROI on AI has been really positive. And valuation-wise, we're just not in a bubble. I couldn't agree more. The other thing that I would say is you can contrast the actual adoption and usage of the technology from then, right? The internet was actually really hard because you had to build a two-sided network. Like, you had to build websites and then you had to get users and it's much more difficult. In the case of the AI tools, you know, all you have to do is kind of light them up via API or, you know, turn on your website, chat GPT, and everybody has access to them, right? Built on top of cloud computing, on top of the internet. Uh, and, you know, you can get to instant distribution, a billion people right away. Absolutely. So uh, the other thing is the counterparties. So you mentioned this. They happen to be the best companies in the history of the world, right? I think collectively, the people who are coming out of pocket, the writing checks uh, for this CapEx, I think they collectively generate like $300 billion of free cash flow a year. Is that right? Some directionally? Round numbers. Yeah, and they have $500 billion of cash in the balance sheet. So whenever people are like, oh my God, it's a bubble. Or is it going to pop? I'm like, I think it's kind of fine. I mean, you know, it, it costs like... 40 or 50 billion dollars to light up one gigawatt yeah if you're in, on stack. nvidia chips 50 on nvidia billion. chips yeah yeah so yeah. you know there's kind of like an 800 billion dollar buffer growing 300 billion dollars every year yeah I'll, i mean um free cash flow at some of them has begun <laughs> To maybe, uh, you know. Well, this is this goes to your point on return on invested capital. Yes. It might we should see that next. Creep down year. a little bit. Yes, yeah. a little bit of a mismatch in the in the build out. But you know, it's you know, Larry Page apparently internally said, "I'm happy to go bankrupt rather than lose this race," and I think that is the mentality for sure at Google and perhaps Meta. Um, it's just seen as existential, and you have to win. 
Hans, we have Larry Page, the founder of one of the most impressive companies ever, stating that he'd rather go bankrupt than lose the AI race. We've heard from Mark Zuckerberg recently who said he'd rather waste 200, 300, 400 billion dollars than risk losing this AI race. How important is it to these companies they win this race? And what impact do you think it's going to have if you come just second or third or fourth in this race? Well, I actually want to push back on the framing of the question just a little bit. If we think about this as an AI race, it really implies that there is a set finish line when you can declare these are the winners and these are the losers. But that's not actually how I think about the competitive dynamics that we're facing right now with AI. I think it's actually a lot more like an infinite game that is going to continue and that there's not going to be a finish line, but instead there's an ongoing game to get better and smarter over time that really never ends. So the real challenge that these players face is just figuring out how to be in the game in the first place and then once they're in the game, how do they stay there? How do they continue to learn and grow and adapt to the changing world? And how do they create value for others so that they can justify their ongoing existence? And admittedly, this is a huge challenge for a giant player like Google that has a lot to lose. And a lot of the strengths that they have are rooted in an older paradigm of how computing works, how the internet worked, and a lot of their core skills may or may not necessarily translate over to this new world. And so it does require big, bold bets on their part to try and remake the company and the institution for this new environment that we find ourselves in. And it's this challenge that is really at the heart of what Clayton Christensen calls the innovator's dilemma, where you have a big, large, existing incumbent industry who on the surface should have every single one of the resources necessary at their disposal to succeed as new opportunities arise. But what he has found is that a lot of times it's small companies who actually are able to match the size of their company with the size of the new opportunity that are able to grow with these new technologies or new markets and be able to actually outcompete and disrupt these legacy and incumbent companies. But just because disruptive innovation is a pattern that we've seen hold true in the past and on the surface would seem to favor new upstarts like OpenAI over these big existing companies like Google, that doesn't necessarily mean that a company like Google cannot succeed from first principles especially when you take into account the fact that Larry and Sergey still do have a lot of power. They are the founders of this company and they are specifically focused and basically have been since the founding of Google to begin with on positioning Google to actually succeed in a world where AI exists. This has been a dream of Larry Page's specifically for many, many years and is actually at the heart of the conflict between he and Elon. And there are examples of companies that have been able to basically disrupt themselves from the inside out in order to make these types of transitions. NVIDIA being one of them, they have gone from a company that was really successful at making gaming GPUs and they actually completely remade the company in order to be able to capitalize on this new trend where they actually created a market for these enterprise AI data centers from scratch. So it's far from impossible for a company like Google to continue to stay in this race. And then it's a matter of who else can actually find their place in this new world and manage to stay there. And the other factor we also have to consider is the question, is AI a disruptive innovation that really favors these new upstarts and incumbents? Or is it a sustaining innovation that actually tends to favor large existing players. And this is a hotly debated topic that I don't know that we have a very clear answer to at this point in time. I mean, there are many ways where it does seem to offer great new opportunities for new companies, but then the amount of CapEx that's involved in these build outs, the complexity of implementing AI robustly in enterprises, the amount of data that actually goes into building these models. There are so many of the components that go into actually being able to leverage AI into large amounts of economic value that require size and scale. So from my perspective, I don't really have a strong opinion on whether or not this is better for the open AIs of the world or the Googles.
So as an investor, what I'm looking for when I'm evaluating all of these different strategic players and the value that they bring in my expectation for their ability to continue to increase value in the future, what I'm looking for is players who are able to get to scale of distribution and who have a ruthless focus on creating value for the specific people in their market that they're trying to serve at scale. And furthermore, what I'm looking for are unique focuses of those companies that they bring together in a way that very few other companies are able to compete with. And that's precisely why I have large positions in companies like Tesla, in Palantir, in NVIDIA, who have each chosen monumentally large problems to solve and are attacking solving those problems in unique ways that no one else is really even trying to copy. Sure, there may be small areas of the business where this person or that person may think, hey, I can do that one thing better. But from an overall business perspective, there's just no one else that really has the culture and the focus in the expansive go to market strategy that those companies have. And then just to wrap this up, I do think it is important to recognize players that do have a finite mindset and who are thinking about this as a race with an endpoint and are willing to take big risks that definitely have the potential to go belly up. It's definitely important to think about the impact that that mindset of winning at all costs can have on the long-term competitiveness of a company. And then also as an investor, you have to consider the second order consequences of what would happen if a company like Google were to implode by overextending themselves, maybe overinvesting, and maybe creating a lot of collateral damage for smaller companies who otherwise may have been able to stay in the game but are catastrophically wounded as a company like Google implodes. And this is exactly what animates the fears that so many people do have about an AI bubble, which is why it is important for us to think deeply about whether or not these companies like Google or Microsoft or Meta that are so large and also so disciplined, whether they're able to actually navigate this chaotic and turbulent time of transition well or poorly. And from my perspective, I do think I tend to give the benefit of the doubt to these companies that are founder led, like Google is with Sergey and Larry's presence on the board and their strong influence over the company, even though Sundar is the CEO. And then with Meta, obviously, and Mark Zuckerberg. And even though Satya is not necessarily the founder of Microsoft, he does have founder energy and is very much in control of the direction of that company. So if I have to handicap it, I actually do think that these companies have what it takes to survive over the medium term at the very least. Although obviously nothing is guaranteed in this world. And as the pace of change in technology continues to accelerate in the coming decades, there will always be plenty of opportunities for the leaderboard of who is ahead of who to change dramatically from year to year, from decade to decade. And so it doesn't really matter necessarily who's in first, second, third, or fourth, as long as you stick around, because then you have a chance to move farther up or farther down. But like I said, the key is just stay in the game. And whatever happens, it will definitely be interesting. It will definitely be entertaining. And for investors, there will definitely be lots of opportunity to make money and lose money. Most people pour money into ads people ignore. YouTube changes that, it builds trust, authority, and a real connection at scale. One law firm we worked with landed 33 clients in just five months worth $330,000 from their YouTube channel. If you run a business, this is one of the most overlooked opportunities right now. Book a call with me below and I can show you how we can make it happen.